brothers do you recall when the grasslands reach to the horizon? And the deafening roar of countless wings overhead. Back when Rome was a village at Britain, the Emerald Island. Before we gave up on our future and buried our dead. We're on episode, I don't know which one. I think it may be 49, I think, maybe. But we are still on the Caucasus and we are gonna be talking about Abhasia. So a couple of announcements I would like to make regarding the Abhasia uh, conversation. First of all, I'm, as a disclaimer, I'm very partial towards Abhasia because it is a place that I personally have been to, that I very much love. It is a place that is very special to me. It is a place that is very personal to me. And so, um, yeah, I'm definitely partial. I'm definitely um, biased in that sense. The second uh, announcement on that I wanna make, I am again, and I'm saying that before every episode, I'm very acutely aware of the tragedies that took place in Abhasia in 90, well, late, early 90s, even late 80s, um, having been witness to a small fraction of that tragedy right at its very beginning as a child. And it's an experience that has partially shaped who I am today, but I'm not going to talk about those horrific events in this episode. Not because I don't acknowledge them, not because they're not worth talking about, but because I want to show the beauty and the joy and the happiness of all these places and all these peoples and all these countries. I understand that there's a lot of conflicts going on there and there's a lot of hatred, there's a lot of disagreement, debate, and you know, competition. Anything that I say is not intended to disrespect or to misinform anyone. Um, I'm not a number one specialist on Caucasus. I am presenting everything I know best I can. And my intentions are very much to just open up the Caucasus to the greater world. So that's my disclaimers here. And those of you who joined us later, I just, again, I've mentioned to other people, I'm not feeling my best today. So if I'm kind of not doing so good today, I apologize in advance. I'm gonna do the best I can for as long as I can. So here we go. Okay. You're a real trooper, Julie. I'm, I do the best I can. Thank you, though. So here, um, sorry, it's again in Russian. I am a Russian. It's a disclaimer. If you have a problem with that, that's your problem. This is a Russian language, kind of a tourist map of Abhasia. This right here is the Abhasian flag. This is the Black Sea right here. This is Georgia. This is the main Caucasus. I think I've shown this map before. This is the main Caucasus kind of peaks. And so this shows, there's the city of Sochi and where the Olympics took place in Russia, I forget in what year. This is some of the main resorts. That's Gagra, that's Pitsunda. This is the capital city of Suhum. You can see that there, this is again a touristy map. So you can see all these places are marked with all the different archeological, uh, historical sites, cool things you can do. Here is people on horses. Here you can go hiking. You can see that this is a region that is very rich in different environments. Now it is on the Black Sea and slopes down to the sea where there's really beautiful be beaches. And then there is mountains, really tall mountainous peaks towards the center, towards away from the shore. This is Russia right here. This whole region is Russia. So Apsni is one of the ways that the, the Abhasian people refer to themselves. We talked a little bit about the Nart and Nartic epic stories, Nartiada. And that is the epic story cycle. It's something akin to the Iliad, Odyssey, so on and so forth. Therefore, the word Nartiad, because it's about the Narts. It's the story of the Narts. Well, in this episode, rather than using the epic poetry or epic tales, I'm going to tell you a few fairy tales of the Abhasian people. Now, who are the Abhasian peoples? Well, these are the peoples. We've talked last time, we talked about uh, Georgia, right? And Georgia's right here again. Abhasian people and Georgian people uh, have had a very complex and extremely, extremely, when I say ancient, I mean ancient, we're talking about Southerns and Southerns BC uh, years, history, where these two regions, they're, they're obviously side by side, they have been interwoven in their formation of statehood, then, then they split, then they interwove, then they split, then they interwove, and so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of... Um, conflict and there's at the same time a lot of joint history uh, which is debated very hotly right now um, at, 
one point in time, the Abhasian kingdom kind of, or the Abhasian elite, from what I understand, dominated the Kol. Like, there's a big debate: who is the Kolhide kingdom? We talked about the Kolhide kingdom last time a little bit. It's mentioned in the Greek mythology about the, you know, the mythos of Jason traveling to get the golden rune. Uh, well, they got, he got it from somewhere in this general region, but whether it's Kolhide that you know, is the place where the Georgian people lived, the where the Abhasian people lived is up for debate. Uh, there's the uh, Abhasian people who live there. There's also Abazin peoples. And, and then there, again, it's debated whether or not this group exists linguistically, or um, it definitely exists ethnically. But at one point in time, at the end of the 19th century, most of them up and relocated to the Ottoman Empire, but that's the Ubuh group. Well, those three languages are very closely related. Now, the Abhasian now, the Abhasian peoples, they are uh, Christian. Uh, the Ubuh peoples, for example, they are mostly Muslim. Uh, the Ubuh language is believed to be extinct, but there are people who are trying to revive it. We all know, for example, the Welsh language was considered to be extinct up until very recently, but now it's more or less being discussed, you know, at least people are trying to revive it. Same sort of thing is happening here. Um, again, debate on whether or not the Ubuh people exist as such or not, I believe that as long as the people who carry on the memory and the culture exists, so does the peoples as such. But, so the language group of the uh, Abhasian, I'm just going to call them Abhasian for convenience of our conversation, and the Kartvelian language group, which is the Georgian people right here. So this is the Abhasian peoples and the, you know, Ubuh and so on. So these peoples right here, their language group is more closely related to the people on the other side of Caucasus, to the Dagestani people, to the, um, and, and, uh, what's called, nah, let's see, Nakhchi people, which is the Dagestani, Chechen, Ingush peoples, those kinds of peoples. There's closer relation to peoples who live in this region, but it's, a different language group than the Georgian language group. Remember, the Georgian language group is an isolate. Well, there's very little cross, uh, again, cross kind of in infiltration, cross contamination of these two languages, which is very strange because these two groups of people have, have historically lived side by side since antiquity, like at the very least guaranteed at least 1,000, maybe 2,000 BC. And yet there's very little cross permeation of these two languages. And that is a current mystery. This language right here has quite a few contaminations and permeations, the Georgian language from the Indo-European languages, but not from their neighbors and vice versa. So that's just an interesting thing to keep in mind. Now, Abhasia is known, of course, for its hospitality, its wine, its, um, you know, Abhasian nature is very unique. It has some of the most diverse um, as far as different available um, plants go, like as far as the diversity of the plants. Um, so their biodiversity, as far as animal life, up until very recently, there were even the wild, you know, uh, tourists still live there. Uh, their biodiversity, as far as their plant life, I mean, this is a region that has been extremely rich, rich in resources. It is considered to be a part of the Ice Age Refugium or Ice Age Refuge, where peoples could... Um, live in during the ice age and hide like humanity in general could hide as far back as the ice age and it still had very thriving life at that time and this is a region that is known for people who live probably some of the longest lived people in the world so let me go ahead and share this video real quick i just want you to show you this is a music now this is a soviet video this is a soviet um dance group that i'm about to show you this is this the used to be one of the before the events of 1990s was used to be one of the uh trademarks of abhasia so there's some of the so oldest so people this is the youngest group of the uh of this dance group that's known as narta I mean, look at the posture of these people. Look at their, I mean, how many people do you know who can even do this at, I don't know, 60, 70? These guys are, a lot of them, 80 and up. I just wanted you to see what the Abhasian people are like. They are people who are very vital. They're people who are very, um, you know, they, they burst with life. They burst with passion. They burst with humor, with good naturedness. But they're also very warlike when they need to be, they can be very passionate in both senses, good and bad. I had the privilege of knowing some of Haitian people personally. And again, hospi very hospitality, again, hospitality, hospitality. Nathan, remember, as you mentioned, and uh, just a lot of interesting stories like that. Quick question. The, um, 
the map that you were showing earlier, that looks like, a, is that a tourist map? Yes, it's an old one. Yeah, because um, like what you're talking about, I, I love that there are palm trees around right. one of the churches. Right, and there's a lot of palm trees there. Uh, you got to understand, this was an old tourist map. This is now more or less on and off a war zone. At least it has been for the past. It, it isn't as much now. Now it's come down. 2008 Russian-Georgian uh, conflict was partially uh, around that whole issue. I, like I said, I don't want to go into modern politics. There's some ethnographic images of the Asian people. You know, you noticed in all these people from the Caucasus, of course, this is a modern element of the costume, but a lot of them have these here. You know, weapons have always been a very key part of the warrior cult. Now, these are some of the views of the, of, let's see what this is. So just general views of uh, Abhasia, of uh, Suhumi. I just want you to see the kind of place that we're looking at, the kind of diversity, kind of beauty. I want you to fall. This is called the Blue Lake. It's really high up in the mountains and the water. And this is over sapphire blue. This is a monastery. I'll have some more images of it. Um, it's a new Afghan monastery. You can see it's really rather large and very uh, respected. This is an old, I mean, this place is so packed with antiquity, with history. Um, this is a famous old bridge over a river. You can see there's a lot of ruins, old and new. Another view of the city, just, it is a place of a famous place of the vacation where all the Soviet elite used to vacation. Stalin had a couple of his, you know, vacation homes there. Uh, this is a dolmen somewhere. We've talked about dolmens before. I mean, obviously, uh, some people um, think that the dolmen and makeup culture may be the direct ancestors of the people of Abkhazia. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, that's a whole different topic. Okay. If we have time, we'll go to that. But so where did the Asian people come from? Well, there's three theories. The theory number one, back to the Hatti and the Kaska people that we hear about in the Hittite and Assyrian and so on chronicles. People who more likely were more likely than not were Caucasoid in nature. And uh, Hatti, of course, being the substrate uh, population of the Hittite empire. Hittites being more in the European speakers, they rolled over the original Hatti substrate later on and they took on part of their name. The Kaska people are the people that the Hittites were constantly at war with. So one theory says that the Kaska Hatti people may be the ancestors of the modern Abhasian people. The other theory says that this population developed purely in within the region. And the third, I mean, there's a lot of theories. This is just a couple of them. And the third one, the one that I most subscribe to, is the idea is, is that the population is acted ah. That tonic. In other words, it originally developed within the region with influx of people that when they came to the region, they overlapped the original population, intermixed with it, and got heavily dominated by the cultural, by the um, physiological, by, uh, you know, industry adaptations of the local people, because any local population by this point in time would have been really well adapted to the region. The reason why I believe that is the case, and I'm going to just kind of do an overview of the entire Caucasus, is, is that at the fear of sounding somewhat racist, I mean, the Caucasian people, um, regardless of whether you have a Georgian, an Armenian, um, uh, somebody from uh, Abkhazia, somebody from Dagestan, somebody from Chechnya, yes, there are variations, but overall, there's a general, the same morphic appearance to these peoples, which is very pronounced uh, facial um, stuff, um, very ego-like. Uh, profile. I'll put it that way. Um, it's very noble. It's very well known. And this kind of morphological appearance actually goes back archaeologically all the way back to uh, pre more or less when the first anatomically modern humans first arrived in that region and started mixing together and formed some sort of a uniform group. The fact that all these different peoples have almost identical or similar physiological appearance, and yet they have completely different cultures, utterly different language families, groups, and even, um, you know, clades. Uh, the fact that, that despite all this difference, the physical appearance is somewhat similar to me, suggests that there was an original substrate there, um, that whatever newcomers came to were subjugated to just simply because the people who originally lived there were better adapted to the region. That type changed very little over, the, over time, and there are some suggestions that that may have been the type of peoples that originally lived, gosh, all over the region, you know, uh, Anatolia, all the surrounding areas, but that they later got driven up into the mountains. So um, that's what I believe. The Abhasian language is one of the most old and the most complicated languages in the world. It's one of the hardest languages to learn. It is exceptionally complex. And there are some echoes in the modern Abhasian and recent Abhasian, um, 
what would you call it, folk culture, fairy tales, and you will see that in some of the fairy tales I'm going to share. Um, there's some echoes of a very ancient um, traditions. There's, you know, matriarchy is such, of course, and nowadays by most um, archaeologists and anthropologists is dismissed outright. But it seems like there was at least matrilineal society because there are echoes of that memory in some of the stories and rituals and practices very recently and modernly in Apasia. The fact that, for example, when young people get married, that they're usually the custom was that they would build a house in their mother-in-law's yard, their first house. Um, the role of Shatana or Satana, um, as uh, she's known in some other cultures, who is, of course, the mother of all of the Nards, is highly elevated within the Apasian um, cultural tradition, within the Apasian cultural memory, within their interpretation of the epic uh, cycle. And then there's other interesting little um, stories that echo to that. So I'm going to tell you some fairy tales throughout this episode, if you don't mind. The first fairy tale is going to be about how people regained or reclaimed the fire. Well, once upon a time, in Abhasia was covered by thick forest that was full of wild of life and was just plenty of trees that bore fruits. People never had to, uh, you know, farm. They never had to work hard. They could go to always, you know, take a fruit of the tree. There was plenty of game around. They could easily hunt. It was a very plentiful land and happy, healthy, and good, kind people lived there. But people back then did not know how to acquire a fire. They had an eternal fire that forever burned on, in, in a cave on the mountaintop. And for centuries, they supported this fire, made sure it never went out. Because they needed that fire to warm themselves and to you know, light their houses to cook upon. But one day, a horrible, horrible tragedy happened. The fire was actually snuffed out. And the people started coming down and crying and woe. What are we going to do now? How are we going to live now? We, have, we don't know where to get fire. We don't know how to acquire fire. How are we going to cook? How are we going to warm our houses? Or war is us. Our whole people were done for. If there was only a hero, if there was somebody willing to go up to the sky and take a little chunk of the sun from the sun and bring us that fire so we could reignite our fire so we could continue living. And that's when... Uh, a voice rang out in this crowd of lamenting folks. And uh, he said, young man, beautiful young man, you know, very attractive youth stopped forth. And he was a young warrior. And he said, people do not cry. My name is Amra. And I'm willing to go and regain for you the fire that you have lost. I am an excellent bowman and I can shoot at the sun. And I will wound the sun and I will make a little droplet of the fire drop down to earth. And you can reignite your flame from it. And the people said, oh, Amra, Amra, take anything you need from us. Take our food, take our hands, take our legs, take our minds, take our hearts. We all will come with you for this very noble deed. For without this fire, without this little bit of the sun, we're all doomed. Oh, you are our hero, you are our savior, Amra. And Amra went to the top of the mountain and he pulled back his bow and he fired an arrow at the sun and he wounded the sun. And the sun wounded and hurt it bled and little droplets of fire started raining down upon the land and it this little, little droplets of burning scalding hot sun fire ignited the old flame but they also ignited all the, all the forests and burned up all the trees ignited all the animals and burned up all the wildlife and this fire burned and raged raged and burned for three months until the forests were only left on some little coves upon the mountains but most of the mountains were laid bare and the people cried out and said, oh, Am Amra, what have you done? Yes, you brought us back the sacred fire, and yet you have destroyed our source of food. We're now forever doomed, Amra. You have brought us nothing but doom. And Amra, being really saddened by the fact that his people were so hurt by his heroic deed, he said, okay, then I shall leave you all. And he turned into a ray of light, and he said, I want you all to be happy, so I'm going to bring you warmth and sh shine upon you. And um, he turned into a ray of sunlight that flew away. And so the word for the sun today in the Abhasian language is Amra. Um, and, uh, you know, when a sunlight, when a ray of sun falls on somebody, brings people warmth, brings people joy, brings people happiness. And that's the story. And people had to learn how to farm and so on and so forth. It's kind of fall from heaven story. But I think that's a very interesting story because I think it harkens to some extremely archaic times. Any thoughts or comments?
Well, that's quite a fairy tale. I've never heard of that one before. I think it harkens to that time. You know, we all heard about a time. I mean, there was a place in China that now they have this proven, but the idea that humans at first did not know how to acquire fire, they could only maintain naturally occurring fires. I think that's echoed in the story a little bit. I mean, even just a couple hundred years ago, before the invention of things like matches and more advanced things, fire was very important and people would transport fire long distances. That's why we, we even have one of those old uh, fire boxes of, you know, I forget what you call it. But it was for, uh, oh, our fire went out. Go over to the neighbors and get some fire. <laughs> right, because, I mean, if it was, gosh forbid, it was raining or, you know, the weather was poor or, the you know, all the moss or whatever around you was wet. Uh, let's see, the, the uh, guy that, that was found in the, the Alps and in Italy, the, the ancient man, he had the fire kit in, on him. Right, right. Yeah, right. and it also speaks to another uh, widely held, if you will, uh, uh, lesson or wisdom, and that is uh, nothing is ever free and everything is earned. I mean, a lot of people used to remember when we were talking about, for example, Tasmanian, sorry, I'm jumping back to the, about the Tasmanian Aboriginal people uh, that they used to carry coals around with them oftentimes rather than uh, attempt to relight in those wet jungle conditions, try to relight their fire in place. I mean, a lot of people did that. It's pretty common. But another fairy tale I want to tell you is not, it's one of the or origin stories of whatever you want to call it of the Abhasian people. Now, don't take this literally. This is not an archaeological, anthropological, or genesis idea. This is a fairy tale. So once upon a time, the old men say that uh, the people of Abhasia used to live some far, somewhere far, far south, somewhere as far as Egypt. And there lived the people of Abhasia, whose skin was, you know, kind of... Uh, golden kind of the color of the sand and then the, the nearby them lived a tribe of peoples whose skin was as dark as the fertile soil and that they both peoples had kings and they had a custom among them that the young prince the child prince the little boy of the people of the dark skin would be fostered in the family of the Asian peoples or proto Asian people people who were the ancestors of the Asian, and their young prince would be fostered in the black family and so this went on until one day a terrible, terrible mishap happened. Uh, the young prince, you know, the young prince of the chocolate people, uh, he uh, was playing. And the king of the people of Abhasia, later on people of Abhasia, was away. And uh, the nurses who were watching the little boy, they weren't watching him well enough. He fell into a rose bush and he poked out his eyes. And so when the king came back, he was horrified because this child who was left in his foster care has been horribly injured. And he did not know how the other king would react to the news of such a horrible injury to his son, such tragedy. But of course, being an honest man, he at once sent messengers to the other king and he informed what had happened to his son. And of course, the other king was completely outraged. Um, you know, they took the heir to the other kingdom and they also took out his eyes, they poked his eyes out and a war ensued between the two people and was a bloody and ruthless war, and much blood was shed. And so much hatred and so much hardship befell uh, the two tribes that eventually the people who later would become the Abhasians decided to leave this land and they started running north. They started retreating north, looking for a better place to live. And they were traveling for days and nights and months and they were coming across new territories, but they knew that behind them in hot pursuit was the king of the other people uh, who was still desiring for, for revenge for his young heir and for all the people who got killed in the ensuing war. And so at one point in time, they came across an old lady. And the old lady said, where are you running, people? Uh, you know you know that only a couple of days behind you in hot pursuit is this uh, leader of the other people. And he's riding upon a terrifying beast. His hoof, hoofs are like iron. And his body is like a giraffe. And his head is like that of a donkey. And he will have no, no mercy for you. Well, woe is us, started crying you know, the retreating, the fleeing people, they said, what can we do? The old lady said, I have a solution. I need you to give me some uh, flour. I need you to give, bring me some water. I need you to bring me some, you know, butter and bring me some salt. And she quickly, quickly, she made some bread. She made some flat bread. She salted the flat bread and she laid it across the ground, you know, several flat breads. And of course, when the pursuing army came hot on their heels and the, the animal, you know, the, the, this beast that the leader of the pursuing army was riding came upon these, this chain of this kind of wall of bread, the animal immediately stopped and would not go any further. 
and the outraged king, you know, he kept whipping and whipping his steed, and the steed still wouldn't move. So confused, the king scratched his head, and he climbed down of his steed, and he looked to see what was going on. And he looked down, and he saw that there was bread, bread with salt, bread and salt on the ground. And at that point in time, he knew that he could not continue pursuing these people, because you cannot step over bread and salt, which is back to the idea of hospitality. Because if people have given you bread and salt, that's a peace pacifying gesture, that's a friendship gesture. And th that was against their tradition to cross the line. And he, at that point in time, the two nations made peace. And, uh, you know, the people of the South, they went back South and the people of retreating tribe, they continued traveling further and further North until they found the new homeland in Abhasia and that's where they settled. That's kind of an interesting story too. Now there's no indication, I just want to make it very clear that the people of Abhasia originated in any way, shape, form in Egypt. There are quite a few instances of actually people from African origin living in Abhasia even today. I'm not knowledgeable enough about how that happened, but I do know that that has happened and it's still happening much as I think it's just kind of cross-continental trade with the Greeks, but it's just an interesting origin story right there. Uh, as, as the adage goes, an eye for an eye makes both men blind. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Some of these legends will have a basis in fact, like it, it's a, almost like a racial memory. So um, coming from elsewhere may actually actually have happened. But the details, of course, have been you know, changed over the years. But the, the fundamental core of the story is probably accurate. It's very, very archaic. And that's why I think sharing these fairy tales is going to be interesting. I'm going to tell you just a couple more if you guys are not bored of, bored of the fairy tales yet just because I think they're interesting. So this is an illustration of my next fairy tale, and it's kind of a cute fairy tale. This is a fairy tale about an old man and a giant. Now, giants are prominent in a lot of these stories. Remember, some people, they're enemies, and they're against the Nards. The Nards fight the giants, and in some stories, the giants are the Nards, and that's usually people to whom the Nards have become foreign and evil peoples. But once upon a man time, there lived a little old man. It was a little old woman. They lived in a little hut. And the old man liked to talk and he liked to tell big tales and he liked to talk, 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 talk. And um, the, his wife, she got tired of this. She said, man, you always talk, you talk, you run your mouth. I'm sick of you doing that. You know, take this, you know, she made him a little package with food and she said, take this and just leave. Just get out of the house, go somewhere else and don't come back until you bloody grow up. And the man stepped out on, onto the path, into the forest. He didn't know what to do, but he sighed and he just kept on walking until he came to a big, big mountain river. Mountain river that was, you know, the waters from the ice melt coming down off the mountain. And so the river was really wide. And on the other side of the river stood a giant, a big, hairy, scary monster, kind of yeti, triple size, you know, giant. And the old man, being brave, because the giant was on the other side of the river, and the river was very mighty at that time, yelled to, to the giant. He said, hey, you hairy beast, come here and, you know, transport me across the river right now. The giant, of course, got very angry, and he roared, and he grabbed a big boulder from the side of the river, and he squished it until water came out of the stone. He threw it down on the ground. Ah, said the little old man. He quietly reached into his bag. He pulled out a piece of cheese, pretended to pick up a rock, and he squoze it really hard. And of course, the water came out of the cheese. The giant rubbed his head and said, ah. He grabbed another bowl and he rubbed it and rubbed it into dust, and the dust fell down from the stone. And the old man, not being stupid man, he grabbed a piece of bread and did the same thing. He says, I'm just as mighty as you as a giant. Come here and be my you know, my ride across the river. And the giant got frightened at that point in time because the man seemed really small, but he seemed to do these mighty things. So the old man was traveling on the back of the giant across the river. And the giant goes, old man, you seem to be very light. You know, you seem to be rather small and light. Ah, said the old man, man it's because I'm holding on to the heavens. That's why I seem so light. If I were to only let go, you know, you'd feel the pain of it. The giant said, well, why don't you let go a little? Okay, said the old man. He pulled out his little dagger. He started poking the giant in the shoulders. The giant said, okay, 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 grab back onto the um, heavens because it's, it's uncomfortable. Uh, so they, you know, they crossed the river and they were wandering towards the giant's home. And uh, of course, both of them were getting hungry. And the giant said, hey, old man, why don't you go and make some noise and rush all the animals towards me and I can get us some food to eat. Okay, said the old man. He went off into the forest and he let go of all his horror and his fear of this giant. He went, ah! 
and many, many beasts rushed towards the giant, and uh, the giant was quite impressed by all the spray that this little man was able to drive towards him. So he killed some of the spray, and he took a pine, and he, you know, cleared off all the branches, and he started putting the animals onto the pine. I'm skipping some of the turns and twists of the story just to make it more manageable. But bottom line is he was ready to, and he said, hey, old man, I need you to go into the woods and find uh, some dry wood so we can make a fire. Okay, said the old man, but he didn't have an ax. He didn't have anything to cut the wood with. So he thought, what should I do? Ah, there's some wines. So he found some wild growing wines and he started tying some huge tree trunks of this, you know, upright standing trees together in a net. After a while, the giant got tired of waiting. He went out there and he was like, hmm, where's this old man? Hey, what are you doing? Why are you tying these trees together? Well, the old man said, hey, I was about to pick them up and carry them. And the giant says, I'll help you. So he picked up the trees, you know, that the old man had tied and the old man grabbed onto the one of the branches, rode back to the giant's house. Long story short, the giant got very scared of the little old man. You know, he decided to kill the old man um, after they ate their meal. And of course, the old man threw some of the deer off the you know, cliff near the giant's uh, cave. So the giant thought that the little old man ate a lot more than him. Uh, the giant tried to boil the old man. He tried to boil, you know, pour some boiling water over him while he slept. But the old man predicted this. He hid, you know, he left kind of a doll of himself over, you know, piece of wood with his coat over it. And in the morning, he's like, hmm, you know, I felt kind of hot and sweaty last night. I wonder what happened. And the giant was like, wow, I burned him with boiling water and he was just hot and sweaty. So the next day, the giant grabbed a burning, you know, spear and he poked this little effigy that the old man made. And the old man, of course, hit again. And in the morning, he was like, you know, some bug was biting me and tickling me last night. And the giant got very fearful. He carried the old man home. Jan was very afraid, you know, and he was sitting in his cave going, man, this is scary old man. He seems so small, but he's so powerful. Jackal came by and the jackal said, you stupid, stupid giant. This old man, I steal chickens from him all the time and he can't do anything about it. He's just pretending. Here, I'll show you. And they went to the old man's house, you know, and the giant said, hey, old man, I hear that you're just a weakling. But the old man called to his wife, said, old wife, where's my giant killing big gun? And he started, they started rattling pans and they started making noise in the house and the giant got very scared. And he said to the jackal, you lied to me, you beast. He grabbed the jackal, he smacked him uh, on the ground and killed the jackal. And then he ran away uh, in fear of the little old man. And ever since then, there's no more giants in Apatia. But that's a cute little story. Mm. You ever heard Jack tales? Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed uh, that, by the way. Thanks for telling that story. Yeah. Um, when I oh, was I'm growing sorry. up in um, Appalachia, which is a kind of a rural part of eastern U.S., um, storytellers were very revered. And one of the things that was kind of an old story that went around was Jack tales. And Jack was this normal kind of guy you know, not too big, not too smart, but he was very clever. And there were always these stories about how he would get into adventures and get into trouble. And it seemed like he was going to be done in, but he would use his cleverness to get out of trouble and find a way to come out on top. And I thought, you know, there are a lot of these elements that seem to be very common. And it just reminded me of that. Well, and I think those are cultural elements that travel from one culture to another throughout human history. I'm just sharing a couple more images before I finish up with one more fairy tale. So I guess this is a little bit less. So this is a view from an abandoned resort. There was a lot of really plush, very um, cozy, very beautiful um, resorts. This is an abandoned building right here. That's a sunset right here on the seaside. Uh, this is the same, you know, another abandoned resort you can see. The quality of architecture this you know I, you know when i'm done with this episode i want people to at least have some fun abandoned uh, dining room at a resort um another view i mean you can see how beautiful these resorts were you know how well designed they were and uh and okay this is what i want to tell you about so this is um a cave that is in the it's called the new Athen. there's a lot of new Athen cave and uh, up in the mountains of um Apasia. It's not far from the Lake Ritza, which we will talk about here shortly, and not far from uh, some of the other very beautiful tourist attractions. But this is called the New Afan Cave that you can see. And this is one of the largest caves on the planet. Um, stalagmites and stalactites, it has many holes. I've been there and I, you know, I, I must tell you this is something just out of this world. I mean, some of the natural formations in the cave. There's other ones that look like sleeping dragons and other creatures. 
uh, some of the other things I just towards the end just as a by the way of surprise I, I set up the scale of this a little bit closer this is some of the other formations that's a little lake right and here is the scale I'm waiting for everybody to go wow I just said wow to myself that is very yeah. impressive yeah that's like you know something out of an epic uh film or something yeah Abkhazia was one of the tourist gems of the uh, Soviet Union and tourist gems of Georgia that unfortunately is now just barely starting to revive this is new new Athen monastery I just it's more modern but I just wanted to show you just how beautiful Abkhazia is this is a view I mean it's a huge territory as you can see it's one of the oldest monasteries very beautiful uh, place this is some of the views inside the monastery Oh, when you're done with that, Julie, before you get uh, into another uh, story, I had a question for you, mm. but please finish. Right. Go right ahead. We just moved on to a new little section, so please. Oh, okay. Um, it's a, kind of a question about the attire of a lot of the uh, peoples that we've been covering in the, uh, you know, various episodes that we've been doing. Now, they're very well dressed, obviously, but one of the things that I notice is very common is on their coats, uh, they have a bunch of pockets on the breast. And I was wondering, are those pockets actually intended for uh, like uh, cartridges or something? Yep. What is the original? Uh, the, the, the Russian Caucasian wars that uh, lasted for most of the 19th century, some of them earlier. Um, these are very warlike I, people. They've been at war with various surrounding states for quite a long time. Warrior elements in their attire is very basic. To, I mean, you know, before I'm sure it was cold weapons. Now it's, um, you know, more, it's very similar to what's happening in Afghanistan and so forth. The reason that I kind of wondered is because I'd never actually seen that until, well, I was a child growing up in the 90s, and they had that famous uh, Japanese film, Nausicaa, by uh, Miyazaki, and he incorporated that style of dress a little bit, including the uh, whole shell pockets, basically, but it was kind yeah. of interesting to find out that these people basically uh, developed that style, presumably. It's, it's basically a modern sign of people who worry a culture. I mean, back in the day, it used to be knives and swords. Nowadays, it's knives and swords and that. Like, right, even... right. So, so just, just very briefly, uh, Ryan, and, and for the group, the, um, so those pockets, originally, um, they, they were not originally intended, and the Japanese did also incorporate them. Um, but they weren't intended uh, originally for um, uh, um, brass, uh, what we would call rifle or musket cartridges. Originally, they were intended for uh, muzzle loading uh, firearms. Right. They were um, basically it was a it was a tube of uh, paper or cloth, and it was it was round. And what they how how they made how they formed them were they would take a dowel, um, a stick, and they would wrap. Um, uh, paper or uh, a very fine linen or a very very thin cloth around it and then um, they would um, uh, tie off one end and as they would pull the dowel out they would insert the musket and later a rifle ball then they would tie that and then they would put in the black powder and they tie off the back end of the cartridge so then and then they would stuff them in their little pockets and so then what they could do is they could pull out this, this little, um, they had oftentimes uh, seal the, uh, uh, the paper of the cloth with wax to keep it kind of relatively uh, waterproof. And then what they would do is um, uh, to, to use these, and these are for muzzle loaders. And what they would do is they'd, they, they'd pull them out, they'd rip open the, uh, uh, the black powder end, they'd pour the black powder down the barrel, and then you essentially have the wadding for the musket ball and they just ram that down. And that was your kind of speed loader uh, for combat. Interesting. That's where that began. Yeah, guys, and I just want to say that the pictures I just showed, I mean, the, for me, that's very natural progression. But so what Nathan is saying is new to me, too, because those were some images of, and I'm just going to show a couple of them again, of revolutionary uh, sailors, for example, in Soviet Russia, uh, well, before it was Soviet, during the, you know, Russian revolution stuff. But you see how common it was as a part of their costume in movies, even in modern recreations and wannabes. But that idea of carrying, just because when you're constantly firing a gun, you're going to have 
whatever kind of a weapon it is, you want to have access to that material that you need for that purpose. And so, but it, it just, it just the same idea kind of a progression from one to another to me, it's very natural. I don't know if, if it is or not, Nathan, what do you think? Well, well, and, and contemporarily today, you know, um, like, like, like a Mexican bandito, you know, carrying bandoliers, you know, right. around your, I mean, it looks badass and it's intimidating. And, and you so, think of, um, of uh, holsters for pistols, a lot of the little spaces for, I mean, think of the cowboy days when you're, as a kid, they had the little places for putting the bullets. That was, that's just a common thing. Right. But yeah, thank you for bringing that up because it is a part of the national costume now of all of these people, regardless of their origin. So guys, we're running out of time. I just want to, I do have two more stories I want to tell real quick, if you don't mind. Is that okay if we run over just a little bit? So this is the Lake Ritza. Lake Ritza, again, I've been there. This is the lake with some of the clearest water in the world. It's very high up in the mountains lake. Um, it has, um, I believe it's, um, it's not halibut. It has, uh, what's the one grade up of fish from halibut? It's a version of halibut that lives in this lake that's super, super yummy that they cook for you right there on the shore of the lake. Uh, this is the Freshwater like a walleye? Yeah something like that but it's the same lake it's the, the Ritza lake that's a nearby it's a lesser Ritza lake but you can see how pure that water is you can see all the way down to the bottom of the lake from any point so there's a fairy tale about this lake too once upon a time there lived a beautiful girl by the name of Ritza and she had three brothers and Ritza was very beautiful and her brothers of course they lived up in the mountains her brothers oftentimes went out to hunt well once upon a time two bandits uh, were wandering nearby and the brothers were away and they saw this beautiful girl, you know, they heard her singing, they, they saw her and they, of course, became overcame with lust. And uh, one of the brothers said to the other, hey, brother, why don't you go down there and snatch that girl? See, Well, first of all, go see who that is. And then if she's good, you snatch her for us. Well, his brother went down, he saw this beautiful girl and he, you know, he fell upon her and he started ravaging her. And the girl started screaming for help and her three brothers came running to her aid. But by that point in time, it was too late. The, the girl was already dishonored. And so she started crying and her, you know, and her crying turned her into water and her tears were so mighty that they picked up the two bandits and they washed them down the mountain all the way down to the sea. And she turned into this beautiful and pure lake of innocence and her three brothers turned into three mountains that now forever stand in mute grief and, you know, got, you know kind of guard over there violated sister. So that's that fairy tale. And then I have another one that's very kind of, let me get out of here. That's very kind of, um, last fairy tale I wanna say, tell you, it's kind of long, but it's very, I, it's very similar to a lot of folk fairy tales, but at the same time, it's very um, a patient. So once upon a time, there lived a man by the name of Talboy, Talbay. And Talbay, there was not far from his house, there was a sacred boulder. And every time Talbay would walk past that boulder, he would hear a voice asking him, Talbay, Talbay, what do you want? Do you want a happy youth or do you want a happy old age? Talbay did not know what to say. So he went to a wise man and he said, wise man, I hear this voice from the sacred boulder that keeps asking me over and over, uh, you know, what would you prefer, happy youth or happy old age? What should I say? The wise man said, Talbi, why don't you ask for happy old age? Because whatever happens in your youth is not as important as what happens after. So Talbi went, next time he went by the boulder and he heard the question, he said, old age, I want a happy old age. Well, shortly after that, uh, you know, an illness came across the village and Talbi's old parents died. And then lightning um, struck his house and his house burned down. And wolves attacked all his herds and ate all his herd animals. And so now Talbe had to go seek work somewhere. So he took his beautiful wife and their two sons, and they started wandering, you know, through the countryside looking for work. And their wonders, they came across another group of people, other travelers that were uh, traveling with them. And, you know, they decided to join this group of people. And one night they fell asleep. Well, in the morning when Talbe woke up, his beautiful wife was gone, and so were the other travelers. And bereft and begrieved, you know, Talbe tried to look for his wife everywhere. They came across a mountain river. He tried to, as he was taking his older son across the river, a wolf snatched him up. As soon as they came to the, to the other shore, a wolf ran up and snatched his older son out of his hands. He turned around to grab his younger son and basically water washed his younger son away. And now he had nothing at all. And Talbe grabbed a boulder and started banging his head against it and just wishing to die, you know, crying, woe is me. 
Well, a traveler came by and saw this and he said, man, man, stop, what are you doing? He took the boulder away. He said, man, what is happening? Why are you doing this to yourself? You all bloodied up. And Dabi told him what happened to him. And the man said, you need to be a man. This is not a man's behavior. You know, who knows what future will bring. You need to continue living your life. It's not, suicide is not an option. You cannot give up. Go on and live your life. And Dabi, you know, hung down his head. He kept traveling. He came across another little town. And he found himself as a, a job as a merchant's uh, servant. And uh, Tao Bei was, of course, a smart and learned man. He knew how to read, he knew how to count, but he didn't ask for a very good salary. He just, you know, was working as a lowly servant in one of the uh, shops that this merchant had. And one day, Tao Bei noticed that the merchant's assistant, the seller in the shop, was stealing some money. And, you know, there was not enough money basically in the register for lack of a better term. So he told the owner about that, and the owner was impressed, and he fired the salesman and he got Talbi to work in the shop. Well, after some time, he noticed that that shop was bringing in more money than all the other shops. So he made Talbi basically a district manager of all the shops, right? Well, Talbi was doing so good and was so diligent at his job that, at the, you know, the merchant went, who was childless man, he was an old child, childless rich man, he decided to adopt Talbi. And him and his wife adopted Talbi as their, you know, son. Well, in that city in that country there was a king the king was old and the king was dying and when the king was dying he called upon himself all his servants all his courtiers and he said you know once i'm dead i want you to open up my um pen where i keep my domesticated doves and i want you to set those birds free i want you to, but before you do that i want you to gather up all the population of the city in on the city square and whoever the birds indicate whoever they land upon is going to be your next ruler so, of course, all the population of the city got driven to the, driven to the main square, but Talbi didn't want to go. He's like, I'm a foreigner. I'm not from here. I'm not going to come. Well, the birds circled the crowd. They went back to their pan. That's when, you know, the king's servant said, no, 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 no. We're missing people. We need to make sure all the population is here. And they forcibly drove everybody to the square. Well, of course, next time the birds circled and they landed on Talbi's shoulder. And so Talbi became the king. Now, Tabi was a wise and good king, and once upon a time, he heard that there was an old woman living in his city who was always crying, and she was always sad. Well, he wanted all of his subjects to be happy people, so he sent, you know, his guards to this woman's house to find out, to bring her to him so he could see what he could do for her. Well, the guards came to the woman's house, and uh, they said, you need to come to the palace with us, but she refused to go to the palace. She said, no, 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 I don't want to go to the palace. Leave me alone. My life has been horrible. I want to be left alone. Well, they tried to arrest the woman, but her neighbors stepped in and they said, no, really, her life has been horrible. You need to leave her alone. Well, curious, the guards asked the woman, they said, well, tell us about your life. She told them her story and two of the guards dropped their weapons and they ran to the woman and they hugged her and they started kissing her. The woman's husband came home and he saw that two young pretty men are kissing upon his wife and he got very angry. He said, I need to kill this evil woman. To sort out the whole mess, you know, the guards brought the young man and the old woman and her husband to the king so that husband could file his complaint and the husband been said to the said to the king he said you know my wife here she says she's sad she cries all the time but now she has two young dudes kissing on her and uh, the king asked the old woman she said what tell me your story what's going on you know everybody tells me you're so sad and that your life's been so bad but you have these young attractive men all over you she says well the reason why that is is because you know um when i told them my story they recognized that i'm their long 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 lost mother and that, uh, you know, they were, that's why they were kissing me. And the king looked upon her and recognized in her his long lost wife. And the four of them sat around and he asked them to tell him their tale. And the woman said, well, you know, that night when everybody fell asleep, those men, they woke me up, they tied me up, they put a basically gag in my mouth, they shuffled me off and they sold me as a wife to another man. And the boys said the story, told their story. The older son said, you know, Wolf grabbed me and was, you know, first we were traveling, was, you know, first my grandparents died, our house burned out, me, my dad, and my mom, we were traveling. First my mom got kidnapped. And then as my dad was carrying me across the river, wolf snatched me up. But a shepherd saw the wolf, he killed the wolf, and he reared me. You know, when I got older, I came to work for the king as a guard, and that's when I ran into my younger brother. Apparently, he floated away on the river, but there was a flock of geese. He grabbed onto the wings of one of the geese. The geese raised the raucous. You know, the person whose geese it was came to take a look, found the baby, and also raised him. So that's how we found out that we're brothers. And so the king and the wife and uh, his sons lived happily, happily ever after, and he was the wisest king there was.
And um, yeah, that's the fairy tale I kind of wanted to finish with because I think it really tells, I don't know, just something about the heart of the person. I mean, it's a very common story, but it's so uncommon at the same time. Any thoughts, guys? Um, I would say that that is a beautiful story and I just have to do this. That was, that was wonderful, Julie. Thank you. Yeah, I consider it what I call it a practical story. A practical story about using your wits. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we, we need more stories and more storytellers. Absolutely. You know, and I think storytellers are very essential and something that we are losing much in our culture today, and that's no good. That's no good at all. Okay, guys, I want to finish with another uh, little video. Life, life of uh, 104, 110 is pretty darn common. But yeah, so it's pretty amazing. I mean, the fact that these people were still herding sheep, they were still riding horses, I mean, age. That age is respected, age is revered, age is, um, is, is a good and beautiful thing. And that's part of the culture. And so it, it, it takes both. It takes both the individual and the culture and the people around them uh, to create that. And I, I see a, um, in, in our Western culture today, a culture that does not uh, revere age. It does not, uh, um, it, and, and, and it self sets up uh, very unhealthy practices that do that are um, deleterious to aging. Where I live, that we have the about a third of the population is native, and they revere elders. In fact, they, the kids will get food for the elders at big feasts and things like that. And we have um, a couple of brothers whose parents were here at first contact uh, with, with native and non-native contact, and so they're and they're only the second generation. They're still alive. The parents lived up to well over a hundred. And they're, um, one of the brothers is in his 90s now. The other one, I'm not sure he's in his 70s. He, te he does the jigging for the natives or teaches it. The dancing, like you're seeing the dancing reminded me of that because he's, he's still doing it. But he's right. only the, they're only the second generation for, for a, 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 what they call first contact with non-native people, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, no, you know, and I've seen some um, research to the idea that uh, how the elderly people in the population are treated are, is directly correlated to two different aspects. One is the scarcity of the resources in that particular region and that particular group. So when the resources are scarce, for example, it's a really cold climate or really just resource poor climate, oftentimes the elderly are not revered. Uh, oftentimes they actually self-sacrifice. They're either abandoned or they themselves decide to part from the group at a certain age, especially during the, those, you know, skinny years so that the rest of the group, so that the children and grandchildren can live on. Um, Patagonia, I've heard some pretty horrible things about that. I'm not going to say because I don't want to be accused of being very racist, but yeah, uh, various resources, scarce territory. But, and another thing is old, Alzheimer's. Um, the prevalence of Alzheimer's and how clear headed the elderly people are. So for example, in populations where that particular disease is fairly rare, like it is in Caucasus, like it is in Mongolia, for example, I know it's fairly rare. Uh, the elderly oftentimes revered. And I'm actually gonna tell you really, since we're on the subject, I don't know if I mentioned it before about Mongolia. So you know how different people from like different boys and different groups have different ways of being badasses, you know, like, you know, the gangster people doing this gangster stuff, right? So in Mongolia, if there's two packs of like eight year old boys, gang, street gangs coming together and they wanna fight, right? What they do is this number. They go like. And they come at each other as if they're really old, really infirm people because it is, cool to be old so if you like a little street urchin and you want to be a gang leader you walk like a really old old man you shuffle your feet and you kind of you know you go ah ah like your back is hurting and that's the badass walk so that's just a cool little fact i hadn't heard that i, I kind of like that that's <laughs> yeah, so you amusing wanna... that i can understand it. sorry yeah so did you want to say something i know that you type stuff oh, oh yes um we have a philosophy. Oh, you just froze up. Philosophy, um, long life, happiness, basically live a long life in happiness. But there's a whole philosophy behind that, that, that I'm really not touching on. I mean, I can, but it's going to be really lengthy. But yeah, I've heard in our old stories. Yeah, I've heard about the old people, you know, that had to be abandoned a long time ago. Anyway, that's it. 
Yeah, but and I think that's very much. I think that's within each culture. It's just, I mean, because the old people are wise enough to understand that for the next generation to live, sometimes they have to sacrifice their lives, and that's pretty um, reasonable, I think, approach. And especially when it's, when you have a very uh, nature living kind of harsh environment society, I think that makes sense. I know that in Nordic cultures, that's fairly common. Uh, Inuit culture, I've heard at least that the Russian part of uh, Inuit people which are called Eskimo people in Russia. I know that's a slur here, but it's the official name of the people there, but, and they don't object. So, but anyway, I know that was a fairly common practice up until, you know, 17th century or so, just because of scarcity of resources during some years, but yeah. I was gonna say one other thing, if you have a moment. I do. Okay with that. It kind of builds on what Nathan was saying about the, uh, the reverence of uh, elders and basically making them important in society, I would imagine that that has a very strong uh, correlation with their lifespan and their, um, you know, general health and everything. Because now in my family, elders are generally revered and they tend to live a long time and they are active pretty much right up until, you know, a century. And I think that it is partly because, well, it is encouraged to take care of them, revere them, listen to their stories, you know, always listen to your elders and they just keep going. The train doesn't stop until it's time. The elder is actually a thing. Um, it, it's uh, there because they're given wisdom. They're the, they're the leaders of the community. They're the, um, like basically anything that happens, the elders council has to approve um, and they're, they're listened to. Um, and that's, that's just the way it is. The elders are, uh, I mean, it's amazing when you go to a, like a big feast or something and you watch all the kids running around getting food for the old people. That's just, it's just what they do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There it's, it's, it's a power of being needed and being necessary. But they also the kind of these um, repositories of culture, the repositories of knowledge, the repositories of skills, of history, of everything that's important. I think that a culture that forgets its past, that forgets its elderly people, is a dead culture, more or less. It's it's the uh, it's it's the original. Hey, you want to Google something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to YouTube it? Yeah, go talk to an elder. Right. So, well, thank you, everyone. As always, it's awesome talking to you, and I will talk to you in uh, a month now. Okay. Bye. Yeah, thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, everybody else, too, and everybody be well. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. That exist within every man's soul. Every man's and we will live forever, or as long as stories are told. <laughs>